Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Just checking you can hear me okay? Yes, thank you, Ian. Brilliant. So, welcome to this uh, webinar um, where we're going to talk about the SimSafe Discovery uh, product. And just a brief overview of the agenda. I'll start off with a, a quick overview of Satara and then how SimSip fits within the overall uh, Satara family. And then I'll do a quick introduction of the SimSip Discovery software, tell you a little bit about it and, and what it can be used for. And then um, the main part of the talk is to just um, go through the key aspects of PPPK modeling, talk about the scientific background and how that's applied within the discovery software. So as I said, just a few uh, points about Satara. So Satara is a, a large worldwide um, drug discovery, uh, drug dis uh, development and software uh, company. So over the last three years, we've supported more than 200 regulatory payer submissions. Uh, we have 1,600 global uh, clients, including uh, biopharmaceutical companies, academics, and regulatory agencies. And now we're about 1,100 uh, employees across the world. And I think the, the important thing about Satara is that over uh, the last seven years, 90% of um, all the new drugs approved by the US FDA were supported by either Satara software or services. If you look at the kind of overall uh, profile of Satara, we cover from drug development and regulatory strategy, clinical pharmacology, uh, regulatory writing, and also um, modeling with real world um, evidence. And, and where SimSip fits in is kind of in the middle. So we're uh, involved in physiologically based pharmacokinetic modeling, QSP modeling, and also uh, toxicology modeling, so QSTS. And within SimSip, we, we run consultancy projects and also produce software. Uh, and the mechanistic models that we uh, develop are used quantitatively to predict in humans. Um, for instance, the, the physiologically based pharmacokinetics, which is what we'll mainly be focusing on today, what the body does to the drug. But also we can think about quantitative systems pharmacology, so what the drug's doing to the body when it's hitting the pharmacological target, and also um, the kind of off-target toxicology effects as well. And the SimSip simulator, which the discovery tool is based on, has uh, been in development now for 22 years. It's used by 11 global regulatory agencies. And over the last 10 years, we've supported um, the approval of more than 90 new drugs using PPPK within the SimSip simulator and 275 label claims where the model that were developed within SimSip were used in lieu of clinical studies. And also just important to point out that the majority of the top 25 biopharmaceutical companies are members of the SimSip consortium. And here are the um, drugs that have been supported using uh, physiologically based pharmacokinetic modeling within SimSip simulator. They cover all uh, different therapeutic areas, particularly oncology, you can see a lot of oncology um, applications, uh, but also rare diseases, central nervous system, and, and various other uh, therapeutic areas. If you think about physiologically based pharmacokinetic modeling, it can be used across the um, whole R&D cycle, so from discovery through early development and into late development. In the webinar this morning, we're going to focus mainly on discovery, uh, non-clinical, and a little bit of early development um, applications of SimSip discovery. And then next week, Karen will give a, a webinar talking more about the early and late development applications of PPPK. So today, this morning, we're going to, or this afternoon, we're going to focus mainly on discovery, uh, non-clinical uh, applications. Just to let you know, if you want to have a look at a demo of the software, 
Um, it's available, uh, the demo is available on the Satara YouTube. Um, uh, we can make the link available to you so you can have a watch of the, the demo. It lasts about 20 minutes and shows you uh, a kind of application how to use uh, the software. And the Lucentive Discovery tool really has four main um, applications. So we believe it's, it's useful for estimating first in human uh, doses. Um, you can use the tool for screening drug drug interactions with uh, static calculations. Um, it's useful for compound prioritization and selection. So you can run in batch mode uh, physiological based pharmacogenetic modeling for a number of different compounds, look at the profiles um, and the, the kind of concentrations in different um, tissues, and, and then from there, use that as part of your selection process for which is the optimal compound to take forward uh, into the clinic or into human trials. And also, uh, there's quite a lot of um, oral formulation work that can be done with the discovery tool. Um, and so you can use this to help you choose the best kind of formulation for your compound. You can look at controlled release, um, look at solubility and, and other factors that will uh, affect the uh, concentration that you achieve in the body after oral administration of the drug. So those are really the four main applications of the SIMSIP discovery tool. In terms of um, next steps, if you're interested in having a look at SIMSIP discovery, we can make um, evaluation licenses available. Um, and we can also give technical support and help you to uh, uh, use the software during evaluation. Um, so if you're interested, then, then just contact simsip.support.com or I'm sure um, there'll be follow up as well. Uh, afterwards, so if you're interested, um, then uh, let us know and we can help you with an evaluation of the software. Okay, so the main focus of the talk this morning is to look at uh, PPPK modeling using SimSIP discovery. I'm going to go through the scientific background, the different kind of input data you need to build a, a physiologically based pharmacokinetic model, um, and and I'll show you some of the applications of the SimSIP discovery tool. So when we're talking about physiologically based pharmacokinetic modeling, um, what we're doing is taking a mathematical model that has um, knowledge of the blood flows, tissue waves, um, and really describe the physiology of the organism that we're interested in. So each organ in the body is represented by a compartment that is physiologically realistic in terms of blood flow and um, weight. We use also drug specific data, so physical chemical properties, information on permeability, in vitro metabolism, and we combine all of that together within a mathematical model that allows us to predict the concentration time profile in the plasma and the way that we built the synthesis in general is we separate the physiological compound data, combine that with information about the data, and use that to predict the plasma concentration time profile and the time profile in tissues after different administrations. And the real kind of aim of the discovery simulator is to make use of all of the data that's generated during the preclinical stage and really to ease the transition between preclinical and clinical studies. So looking at DDI risk but also making predictions for first time in human uh, studies um, so that you can get the dose right when you go into the, the clinic. Within the discovery simulator, we have physiologic, uh, physiology libraries for the mouse, the rat, the dog, the human, uh, and those are all uh, available for you to use. And you can flick from one speed piece to another uh, fairly easily. So I said, just in terms of the discovery tool, it combines elements of SimSIP simulator and SimSIP animal. Um, we can look at different uh, species, as I've mentioned, um, we have 
uh, some demographic information within the discovery tool. Um, we have physiology for liver, GI tract, tissue volumes, flow rates, and also a specific model for looking at uh, brain penetration of compounds. And to make the predictions, we're using physiochemistry, binding data, uh, and then in vitro data on absorption, distribution, elimination, transport, and also you can uh, model from chemical analysis. One of the real uses of the discovery tool, as I've mentioned, is to allow screening of a number of compounds to support uh, lead selection. Um, and you can run the symptom discovery in batch mode, so you can look at lots of different compounds. Uh, as I said, we predict in first in human, uh, provide an early pharmacodynamic um, output as well based on pharmacokinetics. So if we know the target concentrations of potency, we can use that together to predict the pharmacodynamic outcome. Within SimSip Discovery, we also include non compartmental analysis and non compartmental fitting to help parameterize the model. Uh, and as I mentioned, we can look at formulations and also DDI liability. And I'll go through all of this in the next few slides and explain exactly how, uh, within the simulator, uh, we use the data and what kind of things we need to be able to make predictions of the human uh, plasma and tissue concentration. So if we step back and just think about what do we need to predict the oral pharmacokinetics of the compound. So the oral exposure depends on the clearance and the bioavailability. Um, so obviously we need to be able to predict clearance for the compound. And the bioavailability will depend on the fraction absorbed, uh, the fraction escaping first pass metabolism in the gut, and the fraction escaping hepatic first pass metabolism. So these are all the different things that we need to be able to predict, to be able to uh, use the PDPK model um, to make a prediction for the human pharmacokinetics when we go into the first in man study. If we think about the concentration time profile, um, and if we're looking at all pharmacokinetics, then the maximum concentration, the peak max, will depend on the bioavailability, but also the rate uh, of absorption, so how quickly the compound goes from the intestine into the body, and also the volume of distribution of the compound. So these are the, the different parameters that we need to be able to predict within the uh, PDPK model. If we think about the data requirements that we need to be able to run since the discovery, um, so these are typically what we would need for uh, to build a comp uh, model for a new compound. So we need some physical chemical information, so molecular weight, lipophilicity, um, whether it's an acid or a base and how strong an acid or a base the compound is. We need an estimate of the plasma protein binding and blood plasma ratio. We need an estimate of the in vitro metabolism. Uh, we need an estimate of passive permeability. If we're looking at oral administration, then also we need to think about the aqueous or bioirrelevant solubility for the compound. Uh, and if we want to um, look at pharmacodynamics, then some idea of the target exposure that we need um, and that will help us design the appropriate dosing regime and the optimal formulation that we would like to use in the human. You can use in vivo PK for verification, so particularly from animal studies, if you have that data, you can use that to, to help uh, refine the PDPK model. And within the SimSip discovery, as I'll show you, we have um, a static DDI calculator, so that allows you to look at inhibition uh, potential of your compound, or also um, likely uh, DDI with your compound as a, uh, a victim of drug interactions if you know the fraction metabolized by different enzymes. Within 
uh, SimTip discovery tool. We have a number of prediction tools available. So if you don't have all of the parameters that you need, you can make predictions from in silico uh, uh, models. So we have models that are plasma protein binding, microsomal binding, blood plasma ratio, intrinsic solubility, permeability, and also bile solubility. And there is also an allometry calculator as well. So you can also look at what the clearance will be based on uh, allometry. And all of the different models that we have within the synthetic discovery, we, we can provide the details of the models to you if you're, if you're interested. So in the next part of the talk, I want to spend a little bit of time just looking at the different um, absorption, elimination, distribution, uh, and exactly how we uh, go about predicting those within synthetic discovery. So firstly, if we're looking at oral absorption, we have two different models available for ETEs. There's the first order absorption model, uh, and really this is used mostly for straightforward uh, or, or middle out modeling, where you're not really concerned about the solubility of the compound. So here we're looking at some drug properties, such as the effective permeability, uh, and also the physiology within the intestine, so the small intestine transit time, radius. And from those, we can calculate the uh, small intestine transit rate, the absorption rate constant, and the fraction absorbed. So this is a fairly simple model. We also have within Discovery a more complex model called the ADAM model, so that stands for Advanced Dissolution Absorption, Absorption Metabolism. So within the ADAM model, we split the intestine into seven different segments, and we can look at regional um, absorption from the duodenum, duodenum, ileum, and the colon. And as I'll show you in a minute, the ADAM model allows you to look at uh, dissolution of your compounds, so solubility becomes important. You can also look at transport within the intestine, and so either uptake transport or efflux transport. Um, you can look at degradation, and also we can consider metabolism within uh, the gut wall, and we can do that in either the first order or the atom model. So there's a lot of flexibility for oral absorption modeling. We have a number of different tools available that will allow us to predict permeability. Um, and so really what we're interested in is the effective permeability in human or in any particular species. And the different uh, tools that we have available, so we can use, um, for instance, permeability data, uh, apparent permeability data from CACA2 cells or from MBCK, LLCPK1 cells. We have a tool um, that will predict mechanistic permeability um, in the different regions of the GI tract based on the physical chemical properties of the compound. And also, the user has the ability to uh, define effective permeability, parent permeability, uh, using for any system that we have uh, data for, so for instance, Panther or so the cell lines, all of that data can be used within the summary method. In terms of metabolism with the intestine, uh, we can predict the intrinsic clearance in the intestine from in vitro data. So that can come from data in, for instance, intestinal microsomes or slices. And also, even if you only have data in the liver microsomes, but the enzymes that metabolize your compound. Uh, also expressed in the intestine, we can take that into account um, using absolute enzyme abundance data approaches. And we can do that from liver microsomes or from the combinant as well. So you can get an estimate both of the permeability and the intestinal extraction of the compound uh, using some sort of discovery tool. In terms of how we calculate FG in the first order model, uh, we calculated using this uh, QGUT model um, that was first published now uh, about 12, 15 years ago. Um, so QGUT's a hybrid parameter and it, it considers both the blood flow to the intestine, so Q villi, and the uh, 
permeability of the compound uh, within the intestine. Um, so from the permeability and the blood flow, we can calculate QDOP. And then with the intestinal uh, metabolism parameters, uh, using QDOP and the intrinsic clearance, we can calculate FG. So if we have an FG um, that's close to one, that means all of the compound is um, being absorbed and passing through the, the intestine without metabolism occurring significantly. And if we have an FG close to zero, then we know that most of the drugs being metabolized in the intestine, so the concentration that's going to get into the systemic circulation is actually quite low. Within the ADAM model, we calculate FG dynamically using um, intrinsic clearance and the permeability in each of the different uh, segments. And the metabolism will change as a function of the enzyme concentration in different regions uh, of the gastrointestinal tract. But the important thing is that uh, within discovery, we can consider uh, the metabolism of the compound within the intestine. In terms of formulation options, if you use the ADAM model, there are different options available to you. You can consider, firstly, that the compound is available uh, as a solution at all times. You can dose as a solution where precipitation occurs. And at that point, if the compound hits the solubility limit within the intestine, it will precipitate to fine particles, which then can re-dissolve and be absorbed further down the intestinal tract. We can dose as a suspension. Again, here we have a mixture of a solution of particles. And we can also dose as solid formulation. So we can consider uh, immediate release. Um, we can define the release either as a dissolution rate profile where we don't consider um, precipitation to occur, or we can release to particles where, again, the solubility and dissolution of the particles um, is controlled by diffusion by the model. This allows us then to consider precipitation. We can also, within discovery, look at enteric coated formulations, both granules and tablets. And modified um, and controlled release. So, in total, there are eight different ADAM formulation um, options available within discovery for you to use. And we can also consider, for instance, if you have a tablet, we can consider the disintegration as well. There are um, tools available that, um, from SimSet, such as the in vitro analysis toolkit, SIVA that allow you to make use of all of the um, biopharmaceutical data that's generated uh, for a particular compound and to incorporate that data into the PBPK uh, models. So just to summarize the absorption models, we have the first order model and the Adam model. They both allow you to predict FA and KA. Um, they both allow you to predict metabolism um, but the ADAM model also allows us to consider drug transporters, uh, formulations, and food effects. So there's quite a lot of um, tools within of discovery to allow you to explore the oral um, absorption and behavior of the compound after oral dosing. So we talked about absorption of the compound. Once the compound is absorbed, it will distribute into the different tissues of the body. And within SimSIP Discovery, we have three different distribution models available. Um, and I'll go through these in turn. So the first one is a minimal PPPK model, so it looks a bit like the diagram on the right, where we have the physiological representation of the gastrointestinal tract, portal vein, and liver. But the rest of the body is just uh, lumped together into a single uh, compartment or two compartments if you include single adjustment compartments. So this minimal PVPK model obviously is a little bit uh, simpler in terms of computation. It's been quite widely used and it allows us to look at, um, as well as the absorption, uh, first pass extraction in the liver and then clearance of the compound. 
Um, within the minimal PBPK model, um, we still predict the volume of distribution is steady state, and the volume of the systemic compartment is this, depends on um, any uh, definition of a single or distinct compartment and the physical volume of the list. And I'll talk a little bit more exactly about how we predict uh, VSS when I talk about the uh, PBPK model. So this is just to show you that, that there is a minimal PBPK model available for ETUs. And obviously because of the simplicity, sometimes it is a useful model. We also um, have compartmental models. So here you can define one, two or three um, compartments uh, and just really use this approach for looking at uh, if you have IV data in animal species, for instance, you can fit the IV data using the compartmental model and then use uh, the more sophisticated absorption models to look at uh, different aspects of the oral absorption of the compound. But with this, then uh, it feeds into the systemic, um, or it feeds into the compartmental model. So this is an option that's available, but Mostly when we're looking at using synthetic discovery, we're using a full PBPK model. So here we're defining all the different organs of the body within as an individual compartment. Um, so uh, we have physiologically a realistic connection between the arterial and venous blood, um, all of the different tissues. And obviously, the spleen, pancreas, and gut blood flows from the arterial pool through those and then through the portal vein into the liver before going into the systemic uh, venous circulation. Uh, to calculate the uh, volume of distribution at steady state for compounds with the full PPPK model, uh, we're using um, different methods to predict um, the distribution in each tissue of the compound between plasma and tissue. And that's represented by the term the PTP or KP. Um, so looking at the ratio between blood or plasma and the tissue in each of the different tissues. And I'll explain on the next slide the different methods we have available to predict uh, the distribution into the tissues. And really the full PPPK model is uh, the one that we use most frequently if we're looking at doing optimal predictions uh, and making predictions for certain DNA. So the, the methods that we have available for predicting KP in each of the tissues. Um, so we have three methods available. The first one is based on publications by Poulin and Thiel, uh, but then using the correction published by uh, Beraskovsky in 2004. The second model is based on the publications from, from Trudy Rogers and Malcolm Rowland. And the third model um, extends the Rogers and Rowland model uh, to also consider iron permeability within the tissue. Um, and we're looking at binding to neutral phospholipids, lipids, and acidic phospholipids within the tissue. There is a bit of increase in complexity as we go from method one to method two to method three. So basically the calculations for each use the same input data. So we're using information on the lipophilicity of the compound, uh, plasma binding, blood to plasma ratio, and the charge uh, of the compound. All of that information is then used to predict the distribution between the plasma and the tissue uh, by the different methods. And frequently, when we're looking at doing tests in humans, we can compare the different methods. Um, and we can compare them to, for instance, telemetric predictions as well, to see how well the models perform in preclinical species, and then use that to inform the, the strategy that we're going to use to make a prediction of the distribution um, in the schema for the first in human study. So this is just a, a quick summary slide of the methods available in SimSip discovery. Um, so there are some common uh, assumptions across the methods. Um, but as we move 
to method two and method three, so Rogers and Rowland, we start to think about specific tissue compositions in different tissues. So um, each tissue has different extracellular and intracellular water balance and different concentrations of uh, neutral lipids, phospholipids, and acidic phospholipids. And so all of those can be taken into account. Method two and method three have different predictions for acid bases and neutral compounds. And they allow consideration of ionization as well. So, and depending on the type of the compound, there may be big differences between predictions from method one, method two, and method three. Uh, generally, for a basic compound, we, we, we can prefer to use either method two or method three. So we've talked about absorption and distribution. So uh, quickly talk about how we scale clearance within the uh, Sunset Discovery Tool. Um, the basic idea is that we can measure uh, the metabolism of compound in vitro. So for instance, in microsomes or hepatocytes, we can follow the depletion over time, calculate the slope, and from that we can calculate the in vitro intrinsic clearance. Uh, the in vitro intrinsic clearance is then scaled uh, to the whole body intrinsic clearance. And to do that, there are a number of scaling factors that we provide within the SIMSIP discovery tool. So information on, for instance, microsomal protein program of liver or hepatocellularity program of liver and the liver weight. And all of that information can be taken together then to make a prediction of the unbound intrinsic clearance in the whole animal. Once we have a, a prediction of the unbound uh, intrinsic clearance, uh, we can put that into the welfare model and we use that to calculate the clearance. Um, so that's shown here. We can also calculate, for instance, the uh, uh, fraction escaping uh, first pass metabolism in the liver or the extraction ratio. Um, so we can use this as an input into the PDPK model. Um, and so what we're doing is really just taking in vitro data, scaling it, uh, and then using it to predict um, human uh, for animal clearance. Um, so the, the fraction unbound in the blood that we use is um, usually making an assumption that the unbound concentration in the Blood and the unbound concentration in the tissue are the same. Um, so that can be um, altered if you have either uptake transporters or reflux transporters. And we do have a permeability limited model available if you want to look at the interactive transporters um, in the liver or in the, the intestine or brain as well. So we can take into account the effect of transporters. This slide's just showing you the different options that you have available for um, predicting clearance with intensive discovery. So we can just predict the whole organ clearance based on my, microsomes, hepatocytes, uh, and also we can do the same thing in the intestine. We can use specific enzymes. We can, have, we can take data where we have enzyme kinetics. Um, and so all of these we can use to make a prediction of, of clearance. As I said, um, the other clearance mechanisms that we can consider within SIMSIP dis discovery uh, are renal clearance and biliary clearance. Um, so in the renal clearance, both um, passive and active processes can be important, and we can include renal clearance within uh, any of the models we developed in SimSIP discovery, and same for biliary clearance. So, if biliary clearance is important, it's usually a, an active transporter process, and we can count for that by um, using specific transporters within the SimSIP discovery uh, product. So, what I've tried to do so far is to show you. Uh, the different input data we need to build a, a model within SIMSIP discovery. Um, and so I want to talk in the next few slides a little bit about how successful uh, PPK predictions are. 
Uh, and these are taken from the literature. So uh, the first work really was looking at preclinical studies. And generally they, they showed that, for instance, uh, volume, uh, clearance and tissue levels could be predicted with reasonable accuracy. So in terms of accuracy, usually people have been using measures within twofold. Um, so Hannah Jones in, in 2012 looked quite extensively across a, a number of compounds where they were trying to predict doses for toxicology studies and showed that use of PPPK was more accurate than using linear scaling uh, from low dose to predict what would happen at high dose. And they did that with a, a set of uh, 39 compounds. In terms of making predictions for humans, generally um, some kind of pre-validation steps used in preclinical models. So you see whether the PPPK approach will work in, in the preclinical species and then use that to help you uh, make a prediction of PPPK. Um, and there are a number of publications in the literature showing the, uh, the different parameters that we're interested in. So for instance, AUC, TMAC, CMAC, by availability uh, can be predicted within twofold for usually 60 to 70 percent of compounds uh, and so there were a couple of studies from uh, Hannah Jones, one from Roche, one from Pfizer and also from Johnson and Johnson. And this was a paper that we published back in 2011 just showing uh, prediction accuracy from single species scaling compared to making predictions from human liver microsomes. And actually, just predicting from human liver microsomes was as good for the data that we looked at uh, as using um, any of the preclinical data to help you make a, um, a prediction of the human pharmacokinetics. One thing to be aware of when you're using in vitro data in PDPK models is that there can be a general trend to under predict from in vitro systems. And so generally best practice is that you need to have uh, some idea for compounds that are metab metabolized and, and the big data sets available. But you can run those compounds or some of them within your system and see whether you have a systematic under prediction. And if you do, then that can be corrected using a, an empirical scaling factor. And really, that's the way that most people are using um, in vitro data at the moment to make predictions of human uh, pharmacokinetics. So there are um, different correction factors that you can use to improve in vitro in vivo extrapolation for clearance. Um, so this is taken from a paper from Manchester Group in 2012. And they showed that this kind of bias correction was the best way to correct uh, for any systematic under predictions. Uh, and again, further studies in, in Manchester showed that um, so some of the empirical scaling factors when you use them to account for under prediction work well. And, and actually that mirrors the experience that we have with it at consultancy group where um, when they're making first in human predictions, that um, using these kind of scaling factors um, allows you to correct for any under prediction. And generally, you can get reasonably good, um, reasonably good predictions of clearance. And so, just as one example of the use of synthesis within discovery projects, this is a fairly old publication now, uh, but from the group of Pfizer. And what they were doing was using in vitro data uh, to predict uh, the human pharmacokinetics. They had some idea of where they thought they would see efficacy and also the concentrations where they thought they would see um, side effects. And that was driven by uh, CMAX in, in this case. So here you can see some different compounds that they had a look at. Um, so you can see the concentration uh, against time for the compound. You can see the um, 
efficacious concentration shown in the bottom and the concentration where uh, they thought they would see adverse events um, plotted uh, at the top, so around about 80 nanograms per mil. So you can see that for the first compound, they're above the efficacious concentration for sort of uh, five to six hours, but they have quite a nice window between efficacy and adverse events. But the second compound is also a reasonable window between efficacy and adverse events at the doses that we're looking at. But for the third compound, you can see that even the doses where they have um, concentrations above the efficacy window, that they're likely to run into adverse events. So obviously you can compare the different compounds that are under consideration using this type of approach, and then the choose the best one for, for advancement into the clinic. So really that's just kind of one idea or one kind of application of, of synthetic and uh, discovery projects. So in terms of making predictions for PPPK models in general, you should always perform pre-verification steps in preclinical studies, try and build up confidence. Um, Clearance can be predicted from in vitro systems, so that needs to be accounted for. Uh, we normally would recommend exploring a range of clearance method methodology predictions, if it, particularly if there's uncertainty in the clearance mechanism. In general, volume of distribution is well predicted across species, and um, often you can use PBK approach together with. Uh, other approaches to see if they're giving similar predictions or, or different predictions. Permeability is normally well predicted using in vitro data or mechanistic permeability model. Uh, and then on top of permeability, we also need to consider solubility and bio relevant solubility for some compounds if we think that there's going to be precipitation occurring within the cavity. Um, so regulators also are starting to emphasize modeling and simulation in starting dose calculations. So this was a kind of uh, an approach put forward in, in 2016 by Mary and Jacob. So obviously they were looking at the toxicology data to define the LAL estimating human exposure, selecting the most clinical or most relevant preclinical species, using an empirical safety factor, and then using that to get the human equivalent dose. If you look at the, the um, guidance from the EMEA that was published in 2016, they suggested a much more kind of integrated approach so again, you consider the toxicology, you know AL, think about pharmacodynamics, so non-clinical in vitro data, use that together to define a safety factor. Um, and then once you've got the safety factor, you can set the human dose. But the difference is that they're putting much more emphasis on using modeling and simulation and taking all of the data that you have together integrating it and making a prediction. And obviously that's something you can do within a PDPK uh, model. So to help with that kind of work within discovery, uh, we've made a number of pharmacodynamic models um, available. So if you look at the uh, discovery simulator, you can predict efficacious dose, and that can be done from plasma or any of the tissue concentrations. Um, so we have, direct, indirect pharmacodynamic models available, and also the ability to custom script any type of pharmacodynamic model you want. So as well as the prediction of pharmacokinetics, we can consider the prediction of the pharmacodynamics. And also within discovery, we've included static EDI calculations based on the guidance from the FDA, EMA, and PMDA, and so they're available for you. We have both basic cutoff models that allow you to look at competitive and mechanism based inhibition, as well as transporter inhibition, and more complex mechanistic static models. 
So all of those are available within the new tool. Uh, and really that was all I was wanted to say in terms of giving you an overview of uh, PPPK modeling, how it fits in, uh, the Simsip discovery tool, uh, and the different types of application that you can have. So uh, thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, okay, so we will start the Q&A session. We received five questions so far, and, and I want to start from the uh, scientific question. The number sure. one is, the what? Uh, can you go to page 30? Uh, in, in the full PBPK model, uh, there is a um, uh, compartment named Generic. Uh, yes, this slide. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, what is a generic tissue in full PBPK model? Is it same uh, same meaning with the rest of the body? Yeah. So within the full PBPK model, sometimes there are specific tissues that you are interested in studying that that aren't covered within the model. So well, what we have within discovery is a, a, an extra compartment called the dynamic compartment, which you can um, modify the physiology to represent any other organ in the body that's not already there. So, um, for instance, um, if you're interested in staying, say, in the thyroid gland, you can put in the blood flow and tissue volume for thyroid and look specifically at the concentration in the thyroid gland. So really, it's just there as an additional compartment to uh, any other tissue that you're interested in that isn't already specified within the full PPPK model. Okay, thank you very much. So it is useful uh, if uh, people want to focus on some tissues that, that is not included in the uh, default model, right? That's right, yeah. yeah, that's the idea of it, yeah. Thank you. The next uh, question is that the uh, page 34, uh, you show the calculation of hepatic clearance. Uh, is the uh, calculation available for all species in the same discovery? Yeah, yeah. So any species where you have the in vitro data um you can make predictions of the clearance so mouse rat dog monkey or human yeah i mean the the basic principle is the same but obviously in different species the scaling factors will be different and the intrinsic clearance will be different but that's all taken into account and you can predict the clearance in any of the different species thank you uh, and um Maybe this is a question uh, from a um, SimSip user. Uh, what is the biggest difference between SimSip and SimSip discovery? If we already have SimSip, we don't need SimSip discovery. Is this is it true? <laughs> um, yeah, so the, the, the main SimSip has um, animals and human but they're all separate so the the differences between SimSip and discovery is everything is combined into uh, one place and so all the species are, are together but the SimSip discovery doesn't have like the full range of populations uh, that SimSip has so there are some applications where it may be useful but if you already have SimSip then uh, that probably would cover most of the uh, use cases and the the idea with SimSip discovery is it doesn't have all of the functionality of the main SimSip mm -hmm. uh, I tried to use a SimSip discovery, and a very convenient uh, uh, function is that we can use the same uh, compound file 
in different species. And this is very uh, convenient uh, in the discovery uh, stage. Yeah, yeah. So that that's yeah, that's kind of the main difference. So there is a bit of a convenience element to it. So it, it can be useful in, in that case. But in terms of functionality, the there isn't as much functionality as, as the main thing. Thank you. And maybe this is a non consortium member. <laughs> uh, is it required to become a consortium member to use SimSip Discovery? No, no, no. So SimSip Discovery is available to anybody who wants, who wants to use it. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's really one of the main things was to have a tool that, that was available for everybody without having to be uh, part of the SimSip Consortium. So um, no, there's no need to, to join the consortium. Thank you. And the uh, if uh, 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 if if they don't need to be a consortium member, uh, what kind of training material is available, and uh, what 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 kind of support uh, the users can obtain from SimSip? Yeah. So. Like as I mentioned, it's possible to get an, an evaluation license. There are materials available on the uh, YouTube and also um, showing different aspects. And and also, if you have any questions or, or need any help, then we, we can uh, help with that as well. We run a, a first in human workshop that uses synthetic discovery, so you can attend the first in human workshop. And, uh, see how the tool works and different applications. But yeah, if you're if you're interested in doing an evaluation but you want some support, then that's fine. We, we can provide that. Thank you very much. So um, uh, the answer is don't worry about the training. Uh, we have YouTube videos and workshops, and uh, if uh, con if contact the SimSip support. Uh, Seems that we, we can provide the uh, support. Uh, yeah, yeah, various support. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any questions? Uh, I think this is all uh, from the audience. Yeah, this oh. is, that's it. Thank you. If you come up with any questions afterwards, then just yeah, get in touch with. Uh, uh, Emmy or, or with uh, SimSip support, and we, we can answer those afterwards. Or feel free to email me directly as well. That's fine. We can, we can answer any questions that, that you have afterwards. Thank you, and thank you, Nariko. And I am Emmy. And hello, everyone. And thank you so much for joining today's webinar. We have only one comment before we end the webinar. So right after we end the webinar, you will see very simple survey form popping up on a monitor. So if you have any additional questions or additional requests to us, including quote requests or further information, please feel free to submit your request or question through the survey form. So thank you so much everyone for joining today. And thank you, Ian, thank you, Narito. You have a great okay. day and great evening. Thank you everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you. I think they're doing that.